God's design for sexuality is what we are here to talk about for the next seven weeks. So until we go to the conference ground, we will be talking about sexuality. First three weeks are going to be the uh, most contentious because those are the LGBT issue, all right? But remember, take the whole series, can't just listen to one, go home angry, and then send me an email, okay? <laughs> Why are we talking about sexuality? Well, because all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that for the purpose of us being equipped for every good work, there's an issue in our culture that we cannot ignore because in ignoring it and saying that Scripture doesn't say anything about it, we're not being equipped to deal with it. We want to be able to bring the good news to everyone, I hope, and to do that, we need to study and be prepared and equipped, and that's what we're doing in looking at the Word and sexuality. But it's very important that we understand and, and one of the most important things in the whole issue of LGBT, of the, the homosexuality, and what the Bible says about it, is that we have to understand that interpretation of Scripture is an important thing. Can I make it say what I want it to say? Well, no, not ethically. But there are people who disagree on the interpretation of Scripture. So let me just very quickly cover how it is we interpret Scripture in a healthy, God-honoring way. The fact is that there are multiple components in understanding Scripture. Reason matters. If you're unreasonable and you say that things that are contradictory make sense, th then you're being unreasonable. It doesn't work that way. can't take a Scripture that says one thing and a Scripture that says another thing and try to prove that somehow they're compatible. It doesn't work that way. Tradition is important. And when I mean tradition, what I mean is... <clears throat> The saints from ages past, the thousands of years of church history, have had some very mature, very wise, godly people. And they also have had the scriptures, and they also have said things about what the scripture means and how that applies to our lives. We must take that into consideration, as we also must take our experience into consideration. But our, spirit, our experience or tradition or our reason does not override the authority of scripture. But we bring all of those things to Scripture and we say, Lord, what does this mean? Tell us, what does this mean under the authority of Scripture? Okay? You know the bumper sticker that says, the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it? Well, that's great. The problem is you're ignoring the fact that reason, tradition, and experience all weigh into this. And where do they play in your believing? They are part of how we understand. But everything comes under the authority of Scripture. So we evaluate reason, we evaluate tradition, we evaluate experience by Scripture, not the other way around, okay? And that's what we are doing today. That is the approach we take, just so you know. Why are we talking about sexuality, specifically lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender issues? Well, very simply, this is a cultural reality. It really is. Uh, at the age of 19, I had an abrupt introduction to the issue that not everyone was from southern Minnesota. <laughs> Middle-class white boys who join the army and go to foreign lands all of a sudden find out there are people who are very different out there. I didn't know it, didn't realize it until I was 19, and then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, my eyes went, whoa, Okay. Look around us, read the papers, listen to what's happening, our political campaigns. LGBT is an issue. And as much as we would like to say it shouldn't be an issue or we don't want it to be an issue, it is. Now the question is, are we going to take the gospel to everyone or only the people that we're comfortable with? Is the compo church composed only of people who struggle with the socially acceptable sins? Or is the church composed of all sinners? Is the good news only for people who struggle with those acceptable sins? Or is the good news good news for every sinner, no matter what the sin is? The other question we have to answer is, is there more than one unforgivable sin? There is one unforgivable sin, and it is 
It's called blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is simply saying we do not allow the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin or to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In other words, we refuse to believe. That is the one unforgivable sin. It's the only one. Any other sin you can name is completely and totally forgiven by the blood of Christ through faith in Christ. Can I get an amen on that? Okay. So you see where we're going with this, right? There are three positions that we can take on the LGBT issue. There are three. We can take the angry condemning position. We can take the we don't judge anybody position, affirming. Or we can take that position. Now, I will tell you that if you are here and you have had advance notice, I can safely assume that this is not your position or you wouldn't be here. Right? Okay, good. All right. I'm going to try to keep this as light as I can because this topic is heavy enough as it is, okay? You don't want me throwing up up here, do you? I mean, let's, let's try to keep this a little light so we can, we can add some humor in here. There are two opposing scripts, and for the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at these opposing scripts. There's the condemning script that says God hates gays. And the implication is, so I don't have to have anything to do with those people. Is that biblical? The other script, the opposing script, is the affirming script that says, well, God made me this way with the implication that so you should affirm my lifestyle. Is that biblical? We're going to look. And today, we're going to focus on that first script. We're going to focus on the condemning script, and we're going to examine it biblically. All right? Ready? Okay, here we go. The condemning script goes something like this. Now, when I say script, what I mean is, this is not a clearly defined position. This isn't written in black and white somewhere. This is the script that goes through our minds if we tend to hold the position of God hates gays and I don't need anything to do with them. It's, it's more of an unconscious, unstated, unwritten thing that goes through our minds and our hearts and our souls. And so there are many variations, but this is the generic basic core of the script, which basically says, well, the Bible teaches that homosexuality is an abomination. And when we use the word abomination, read that to mean it is the worst possible thing a person can do before God. It's the greatest offense that people can give. And it's a perversion. Abomination. Perversion. Perversion means it's a significant departure from God's design. And we tend to quote Leviticus 18.22. And I'm quoting you KJV, the King James Version, specifically because that's where the word abomination get, gets used, comes from. 18.22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. And then in Leviticus 20.13, also in the King James, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So the script goes like this. Well, because it is such an abomination, the worst possible thing anyone could ever do before God, they have brought it upon themselves that they are going to die and it's their own fault. The condemning script also goes on to say basically this. The Bible teaches because it is an abomination that um, we, we, have, um, we have a right or we have the opportunity, we have the justification to have nothing to do with them. And we go to 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And how we read this is this. Do not be deceived. Men who have sex with men will never inherit the kingdom of God. You'll understand what I mean when we come back. Therefore, 
because of Leviticus, therefore, because of 1 Corinthians 6, therefore, God hates homosexuals. God hates gays. How do we know? We'll look at Romans. Romans even says it. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Well, that's got to be talking about homosexuality, right? Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. In other words, they bring it upon themselves. It's their own fault. The due error. Due penalty for their error. So the assumption here then is this, in this script. Gay people, homosexual people, lesbians, gay, bisexual, transgender, they choose to be gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual. Just like we choose any other sin. Therefore, it's their fault and they're going to pay for it. Therefore, I don't have to have anything to do with gay, lesbian people unless they change completely, unless they choose to be totally different. And the application of that script is this. Therefore, any mistreatment or condemnation, any prejudice or discrimination, even the abuse of LGBT people is okay because they brought it upon themselves, right? It's their fault, right? It's what the Bible says. It's an abomination. That's the script. That's the thinking. That's the reasoning that's going on. And so the question that we have to ask is this. Is that biblical? Before we move on, and look at it biblically, I, I want to tell you that this is not the first time we encounter condemning scripts in Scripture. There are lots of them there, but I just want to highlight two of the most prominent. First one is Jonah. Maybe, maybe you're not that familiar with Jonah, but Jonah, the prophet who ran away and got swallowed by a whale and spit out on shore and smelled like whale puke the rest of the time, he, he sorry, whale spit, He was told to go to Nineveh, which is the capital of the Assyrians. The Assyrians were the ones who had destroyed uh, Jerusalem and taken the nation into exile. And they um, were the greatest enemies of Israel. Jonah hated the Assyrians. He hated the Ninevites. He wanted nothing to do with them. So when God finally convinced him to do what he had called him to do, which is to take the good news of the gospel to the Ninevites, repent and be saved, he went angry. Okay, I'll do it, but I'm not going to like it. And so he walks through the city saying, repent, repent and be saved. And what do they do? They repent. Does God destroy them? No. Is Jonah happy about it? No. He's ticked. He wanted God to wipe them out. But he knew in the back of his mind as he went up and sat on a little hill underneath this plant that sprouts up to shade him from the sun, he knew that God was gracious and merciful and he was angry about it. And the plant withers and Jonah gets all upset and God says, you're more concerned about a plant than you are about these thousands and thousands of lives. That's a condemning script. He wanted them dead. He didn't like them, wanted nothing to do with them. He wanted them dead. The elder brother, in the account of the prodigal son, condemning script. The younger son runs off, takes the father's inheritance, squanders it with prostitutes and all kinds of wild living, comes back, bows at his father's feet or tries to and says, Father, I don't deserve to be your son. He says, stand up. Puts a ring on his finger robe on him, accepts him back, fully gracious and merciful. Is the elder brother happy that his brother is back? No, he's angry. The father throws a party for his son, kills the fattened calf, and is excited because his son that was dead has come back and is now alive. Is the elder brother happy about that? 
No. Does he join the party? No. He wants nothing to do with his brother who was dead and is now alive. He wants nothing to do with someone being saved from their sins. And not only that, he's angry at the father for treating his son with such mercy. So condemning scripts are nothing new. They're everywhere in Scripture, and these are two of the most prominent ones. And I'll tell you that the condemning script does exist when it comes to LGBT issues in the church today. Is it biblical? Well, let's look. So, okay, we'll take it point by point. Is homosexuality an abomination? Yeah, it is, but the abomination word is very inflammatory. The, the translation of that Hebrew word actually more accurately is it's detestable. It is detestable to God, meaning it's offensive, it's vile, it's repulsive. We have to be careful to realize that certain words carry great emotional weight with us. And because the King James uses the abomination and the people who tend to use the condemning script use abomination, it carries huge weight. It isn't intended to communicate that that's the worst possible thing you can do before God. It's, ten, it's intended to communicate that it is a detestable act before God, that the sin of homosexuality is detestable. So let's look at 1 Corinthians in that light. If we're going to read it in the biblical light, then we have to understand this. Do you not know that wrongdoers, those who commit detestable acts will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And here's how it's really read. Neither the sexually immoral, which is not homosexuality, that's sexual immorality, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, another form of sexual immorality, nor men who have sex with men, homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I will tell you that in the Greek grammar, there is no emphasis on men who have sex with men. It is just another one of the sins that will keep you from inheriting the kingdom of God. And every sin in that list is equal. Every sin in that list is equal. We're the ones who make one sin worse than another. Not God. Now let me ask you a question. Don't raise your hands. Do you struggle with any of those? I think there's one I don't. Do you see the point? We're the ones who say, oh, that's an abomination. This is just a sin. But that's an abomination. Well, if you, want to talk, if you want to use abomination accurately, then use the word detestable. And every one of those sins is detestable before God, and it will keep you from inheriting the kingdom of God. We often assume, you see, that the attitudes that we grew up with are the norm. We, we've heard something from other Christians, maybe we watch a certain channel on television or listen to a specific teacher and they're very negative about certain things. But the negative and the condemning attitude toward homosexuals originates primarily from our deeply held cultural assumptions, from our prejudices, our fears, our misconceptions, rather than from the Bible or Christian teaching. Because it really doesn't take that much time in the Scriptures to figure out that homosexual, homosexuality is detestable. Yes, absolutely it is. But so is idolatry, so is sexual immorality, adultery, slander, and many other things that we don't struggle with. That we all struggle with. You see? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But it's neither higher on the list or lower on the list. They're detestable before God. And the reality is this. If we think that we are better or more holy than those who struggle with a particular sin, those sinners, then we ourselves are guilty of the sin of self-righteousness. 
then we're sinning in that attitude. In Luke 18, there's the, there's the story of the, the Pharisee and the tax collector. They're praying. The tax collector raises his hands and looks up at God and said, Oh God, I'm so thankful that I'm not like him because I give 10% of everything. I am so holy. I am so not there. And the tax collector can't even look up to heaven and says, Oh Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the, answer, the, the end of that account says, which one of those two walked away justified before God? And the answer is, the tax collector. So I caution us, generically, I caution us to adopt any sort of attitude or suggest that the Bible teaches that homosexuality, LGBT, is somehow worse or a greater offense to God than any other sin. Okay? That list doesn't even list pride. It doesn't list numbers of things. But I want to point out here in preparation for weeks to come that there are three mentions of different kinds of sexual sin in that list. Sexual sin is a big deal to God. But homosexuality is just one kind of sexual sin, all right? But let us not take this attitude that somehow, because we don't struggle with this particular sin, that we're here and they're there. Homosexuality is a radical departure from God's design. It is. It is a perversion. That's the definition of perversion. When we talk about perverting justice, what it means is justice has not been accomplished. It was derailed. It isn't the way it was supposed to be. Okay? So let's use perversion correctly. It is a perversion. It also includes, perversions also include the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who have sex with men, thieves, greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers. Those are also perversions. The truth is this, God hates the behavior. God hates the behavior. He hates it when people slander. He hates it when people swindle. He hates it when people commit adultery. He hates it when people are greedy. He hates it when men have sex with men. He hates it when people are idolatrous. To suggest somehow that this passage or any other passage is saying that homosexuality, LGBT, is worse and deserves greater condemnation than my sin is self-righteousness. God hates the behavior because continually, key word, continually living in that radical departure from God's design is contrary to God's desire for us. And it will ultimately, if we continually live in a lifestyle that is contrary to God's design, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because God has designed us, God made us, and He has designed us with loving and best intentions for humanity. Do we always find that? No, we don't. There are a lot of people who don't. They refuse to suggest, they refuse to admit that God has designed us. And we therefore have an accountability before Him to live a certain way. Therefore, God does not hate gays. He hates behaviors any more than God hates slanderers, thieves, adulterers, idolaters, We say, well, yeah, you're talking about hate the sin, love the sinner. Well, yeah, that is what I'm talking about. Well, that's really hard to do. Yeah, it is for us because we're human. But God is God. We are not. God has the full capacity to do that. He has the full capacity to be fully wrathful and fully righteous, fully merciful and fully loving at the same time. We don't. Here's a case where we cannot project onto God our abilities, our attitudes, our limitations. God is God. We are not. 
This is a very important thing to grasp right now. God does not hate the person. He hates the thing that has become warped, shrunken, twisted in them. God hates gays is a slogan that is used by hate groups. It does not come from the Bible. It is not consistent with biblical teaching. And I'm giving you some references there. Please do take a look if you're interested. I also will have some handouts if you're interested that have all the notes, but they'll be on, on the web, so if you can wait a couple days, please wait for them so we don't kill so many trees. The fact is, God loves lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender people in the same way that he loves slanderers, adulterers, even murderers. God loves Muslims. God loves Hindus. God loves... Yes, he does. Is that hard to hear? God is God. We are not. We can't project our attitudes, expectations, and standards onto God. God desires that all people would come to salvation in Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? So then, let me give you one application here. If we really believe that, then the very next time we have an opportunity to talk, interact, even be around someone that we believe is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, try telling yourself, God wants this person to come to salvation just as much, just as much as he wanted me to come to salvation. See if that changes your attitude. So, do people choose to be LGBT? Well, we're going to talk more about this. I will, I will talk more about this next week. But basically, I'm going to give you the quick outline now and we'll talk more about it. Is it nature or nurture? Is it genetic or is it environment? Here's where the big argument is right now. Well, it's all, it's nature. God made me this way. No, it's nurture. God didn't make you that way. You were taught to be that way. Well, the reality is, according to Dr. Yarhouse, who is kind of the leading uh, psychiatrist, psychologist on this, the data is very inconclusive on either side. It's inconclusive. They can't prove it one way or the other. We don't know if it's nature. We don't know if it's nurture. All of the studies they're doing, they can't prove it one way or the other. Inconclusive. And the reality is, more than likely, it is a combination of factors. We have to be really careful not to fall into the trap of onlyism, Meaning, it's only one factor. A person is gay because. Or a person is bisexual because. No, no, no. The, very few things in this life are a result of only one factor. Most things are a result of multiple factors, and the same is true for LGBT. Most people are affected by multiple factors. You were, I am, same is probably true for LGBT. So, we should use language that's more accurate in this. And, and I'm going to introduce you to a language right now that we're going to use through the rest of this series. And what I want to help you understand is that homosexuality in the way that we use it is referring to homosexual acts. But when we talk about people who are struggling with that, I want to introduce you to three different things. I want to say same-sex attraction. There is same-sex attraction among people. And what that means is that they have had an experience of feelings or, or something in their developmental years or after that they have been attracted to another person of the same gender. Then there is same-sex orientation. And what that means is that over the course of time, they have had enough instances of a same-sex attraction that they are starting to refer to themselves as being oriented toward the same sex. And then there is also the gay identity. And what that means is that they have, through a course of discovery, chosen to self-identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. But there is no either is or isn't. 
there's gray in there. There's isn't, same-sex attraction, same-sex orientation, identity, and so we have to be careful of the language we use. And we'll talk more about this. So what's most important? What is most important? Our sexuality or our identity in Christ? Our younger generations are being taught that our sexuality is the most important thing. They are. Our younger generations are being taught explicitly, implicitly, consciously, unconsciously that their sexuality is the most important thing in their life. We in the church who understand that that is not the most important part of their life have to help them learn how to, ex how to live out the reality that our identity in Christ is the most important thing and that our sexuality is secondary to that identity. And if I could suggest one thing that the church can do, it's that. We ought to be the people who live out our sexuality under the identity of Christ the very best. We ought to be bold enough and brave enough and courageous enough to be able to say, look, I am a sexual being, but my sexuality isn't determined by myself. My sexuality is under the identity of Jesus Christ. And there's a healthy and a beneficial way to do that. And so you want to know what that is? Watch us. We'll show you. That's what the church can do. But we're not going to do it by condemning everyone that's different than us. Amen? I was a little feeble. Okay. Therefore, if we choose to have nothing to do with LGBT people, are we being biblical? And the answer is, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. If we think we're better or more than somebody else because they struggle with a certain sin and we don't, it's self-righteousness. Jesus taught us by His Word and His example that we are not supposed to be self-righteous. And we are not supposed to shun people because we think they're sinners. And by the way, I gave you the Matthew 9, 12 through 13. It's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. It's not the people who think they're heterosexual and perfect who need a doctor. It's the people who struggle with same-sex attractions who think that their identity is all in their sexuality and they don't know Jesus. They're the ones who need a doctor. So my question is, are we going to come to them in mercy? In the, in the spiritual first aid kit, which is all about Jesus Christ and the good news of the gospel? Or are we going to shun them and say, oh, we want nothing to do with you, you're not like us. The church is not composed of people who deserve to be here. The church is composed of people who don't deserve to be here. Anyone who deserves to be here, um, you meet on Tuesdays at 9 a.m. So, is the application of that condemning script accurate? That mistreatment, condemnation, prejudice, discrimination is okay? No, it is not okay. It is not okay. It's not okay to sit back and say, oh, you can beat the crap out of some LGBT person because they're different than we are. No, it's not okay. It's not okay to sit back and say, well, it doesn't matter if you want to shun them, ignore them, condemn them, if you want to be prejudiced against them, if you want to treat them differently or somehow worse because they struggle with that and you don't. It's not okay. It is not okay. It's not okay to promote that kind of behavior. It's not okay to condone that kind of behavior. It is unchristlike. Remember the Good Samaritan? What do we learn from the Good Samaritan if not that very point? The Good Samaritan, the person who had every reason not to stop for a Jew, had every reason to have nothing to do with him, to shun him. The Jew probably would have walked by him, probably would have ignored him if it had been the Samaritan. The Samaritan stops and gives every, every bit of aid necessary and saved the life of this guy who had been beaten and bloodied. Now, folks, I'm going to say this in the gentlest way I can. There is a culture of people out there known as the LGBT community. They are beaten, they are bloodied, 
they are prejudiced against, they are mistreated, and unfortunately by the Christian church, they are shunned because they struggle with a certain issue that we maybe don't. Does that mean we can walk by them and ignore their hurts and pains and struggles? I hope not. Okay, next week, we're going to talk about the affirming script. If you're upset with me now, wait until next week. And we're going to look at that script. Is it biblical? Is it reasonable? So if you still have questions, or if I have gotten you fired up enough that you want to come and talk about this, activity rooms three and four, or use the website to ask an anonymous question, and we'll do our best. All right? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that we can have a little uh, humility and a little hilarity, a little uh, sense of humor about ourselves. But we do pray that we would take this seriously. That we aren't called to be comfortable. We aren't called to be like everybody else or expect everybody else to be like us. But I pray, Lord, that for this congregation who has grown and matured to the point where we can talk about this, I thank you. And I pray that we will grow and mature all the more as we honestly and openly engage your scriptures and one another for the sake of a culture that is dead and dying and a group of people who are badly bloodied and beaten. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen.